Hello, everyone. Um, it's actually my honor to present Mr. Raju, who's the chairman and CEO of Satyam Computers. Uh, yeah, Satyam is, I don't know if you guys know about this, it's one of the largest uh, tech companies in India and worldwide, uh, reached over a billion dollars in revenues and over 28,000 employees. And Mr. Raju has sort of seen this grow from in the last 20 years or so, 19 to be exact, uh, to grow into one of the biggest companies around. So just to give you sort of a background, um, yeah, I can go on and on about his business accomplishments, uh, but today we're sort of here to discuss some of his accomplishments around foundation and some of the nonprofit stuff that he's been doing. Um, just to give you a recap, um, yeah, he was named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 1999. Um, he was also DataQuest IT Man of the Year in 2000. And CNBC also named him the Asian Business Leader Corporate Citizen of the Year. I think all these things sort of tell about what uh, he has accomplished over the years. Um, and as a matter of fact, he's also the chairman, the current chairman of NASCOM. Uh, NASCOM is the National Association of Services and Software Companies. Um, and it's a very, very well-recognized uh, organization. Uh, but I could spend the whole hour talking about his accomplishments, but uh, the two things I really want to discuss is the foundations he has created, the Satyam Foundation and the Bairaju Foundation. And uh, he'll go a lot more into details about those two foundations, along with EMRI, which is Emergency uh, you know, Response uh, Institute. And this is uh, sort of akin to 911 in the U.S. And he'll go a lot more in detail about uh, Ashi Venkat, uh, both that as well. Just to give you a little bit of a background on the two foundations, um, Bairaju is actually focused uh, very much around sort of rural transformation. Um, and um, as I said, Mr. Raju will sort of give you uh, more detail. I can't do justice to, to his organization. And Satyam Foundation is more around urban transformation. So sort of the, the, all the urban transformation in India around people moving from villages, but trying to keep people in villages, sort of providing entrepreneurship and access to uh, a lot of the services that people are used to in, in urban areas and rural parts. Um, so without further ado, uh, I want to introduce Mr. Raju to take the floor. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, let me dwell you know, I will take 15 minutes, and after that, my colleague uh, Venkat, uh, who is the CEO of EMRI, Emergency Management and Research Institute, uh, is going to specifically talk about the initiatives that we have taken in the emergency management and research area, uh, which is equivalent of 911 in the United States. Uh, we have uh, done some work, and we're quite proud of for the fact that we have made significant progress. Uh, I would like to uh, briefly talk about uh, Satyam for no more than a few minutes. And after that, uh, uh, share with you some experiences in uh, initiatives that we have taken on the corporate social responsibility front, particularly in the area of rural transformation. As a company, uh, we went public in 1992. And when we went public, our revenues were less than a million dollars. And uh, last year, uh, we have, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, done $1.1 billion in, in revenues. Uh, this is nothing compared to the accomplishments of uh, Google. Uh, you have achieved a billion dollars in, in a much shorter period of time. And uh, every internet user uh, is uh, one uh, who appreciates and is thankful for the kind of quality services that we provide. While that is the case, uh, Satyam Computer Services became, in this short period of time, the, by far the largest company in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India. And we were the first, Indian, uh, first Andhra Pradesh company, uh, Andhra Pradesh, which has about 80 million uh, people uh, in that uh, uh, state, uh, we became the first billion dollar company. This means a great deal for a developing country that there are opportunities such as what one witnesses at a global scale 
coming from companies like uh, Google. And as a company, uh, we have always been conscious of the fact that we need to do something and, and give back something uh, for uh, the society. Before I, I, I dwell uh, into that, uh, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about some of uh, the changes that we have seen in the company itself. Uh, in the last uh, 14 years or so, we have gone through many transformational initiatives. The change that we are witnessing globally is demanding that companies reinvent themselves constantly. And this we refer to as uh, different waves of changes within the organization, and uh, they are uh, uh, called orbit, uh, different orbits uh, within the organization. We have gone through six such waves, six such, such uh, orbits. The first orbit began when we were servicing clients, particularly in the United States, by placing our professionals to work at the client's places. This is called on-site consulting. And thereafter, we became the first Indian company to have had a tiny satellite connectivity between ourselves and a company in the United States called John Deere and Company uh, to uh, have started providing services remotely. And this has eventually come to be called offshoring. And we are quite proud of the fact that we were in the forefront of this change. The next orbit for us was to prove to our clients that they can get dependable services from, from us, which meant that we had to prove that our processes were mature. Therefore, quality initiatives, such as SCI, CMM level five, or Six Sigma, or ISO 9000, are the ones that brought us the required rec recognition among uh, the companies globally. And this is orbit three for us. Orbit four for us was reaching out to our clients globally and to prove to them that no matter where we provide the service from, that we are operating very close to where they are. And that meant opening number of centers. We operate from about 20 development centers globally today. And these are called off-site centers. And in the recent past, this definition has been further extended to include what is referred to as nearshore centers. A nearshore center is one which has operations in a country very close to the country where we service our customers. Therefore, Canada becomes a uh, nearshore center for the United States, and China becomes a nearshore center for Japan. This is uh, also referred to as uh, a right sourcing model within our company uh, to make the customer totally transparent to where the services are provided, provided from. Orbit 5 was an initiative meant to bridge the gap between ourselves and companies like IBM Global and Accenture. By acquiring domain competencies and being able to provide relationship management of a quality that we only see in more mature uh, companies. We have made fair amount of progress in that area. We have reached a size of about 29,000 people. And this year, when we came together in our strategy summit, we told ourselves that we have to move to the next step, next orbit, and that orbit for us is about leadership and innovation. This is uh, meaning that we need to deal with issues of importance such that we are able to address the current uh, issues. And that, in a way, extends also to corporate social responsibility initiatives as well. There is as much requirement for innovation and uh, leadership in corporate social responsibility initiatives as there is in a company like Satyam. In the year 2001, my father passed away rather unexpectedly. 
And as a family, uh, three of us, you know, who are brothers, said that we need to do something in his memory. And we recognized that the best thing that we can do is to go back to the villages where he came from, where he had intimate relationships with. And therefore, we have taken up this initiative, which we refer to as the Rural Transformation Initiative. We wanted to take a holistic approach. And we have had, in the last four to five years, a, a great uh, and positive experience in, in doing so. In these 150 villages, there are about a million people. And these uh, uh, people uh, have uh, a little access uh, to, to technology, little access to the kind of practices that we are so used to in, de in, in developed countries, and particularly in the corporate world. And they lack the right kind of uh, leadership. And we felt that you know, if only we could take these back to them, there is potentially something that we would have managed to give back. So we have uh, set out in the initial stages itself uh, certain uh, principles. We call these core values. Uh, the value one is that we should involve people. In a developing country like uh, uh, India, every village may have something like 2,000 to 5,000 people. And there are at least 200 to 500 man years of uh, competency, man years of uh, you know, capable uh, people being able to do some tangible work available. And most of it does not get used well. If only it gets used well, then the access that we have by way of human resource is very high, and it amounts to millions of dollars or crores of rupees. So it is with that belief you know, we have set out to pursue this uh, principle of involving people. Secondly, we uh, have also believed that applying knowledge and technology is most important. The access that we have to knowledge and technology today is so high that we could, by applying it efficiently, address issues at the level of the downtrodden rather very, uh, very well and, and efficiently. So applying knowledge and technology was yet another core principle. The third was making things happen. We take this for granted in the corporate world, but that is not the case when it comes to a developing country and from when it comes to what the government does and the manner in which you know, people are able to manage themselves at the grassroots level. So having taken uh, these as our uh, main principles, uh, we have uh, gone about to identify about 54 different services uh, within the villages. And of these, about 30 are categorized as delivery-related services. And about 20 to 25 are support services. A support services may be something to do with technology, a support service may have something to do with Six Sigma, so on and so forth. There are 20 or 25 such things. And in the corporate world, you would call these, again, support services. You, know, you may have HR, finance, quality, so on and so forth. The same things we felt are the competencies that we have to develop so that whatever is proven in these villages, you can then go back to provide as a support mechanism for other villages as uh, this knowledge base is extended. In the delivery services, we are quite uh, proud to say that we have made a fair amount of progress. Now, we have set out to achieve a principle which we have called the 100% principle. 100% principle is about identifying as to where you stand with reference to a service and where you could be with reference to what already happens in more mature environments. And whatever this gap be, in a way, eliminate it 
in a matter of two to three years. And I must tell you that we have had a very positive experience in addressing issues such as managing water uh, uh, situation in these uh, villages. About all the, you know, every village has access to water, but the canals are polluted. And unless you have a way of cleaning this water, unless you are able to have a, a mechanism of delivering it, they have to consume what is available. So we have established mineral, mineral water plants, and these plants are able to supply water in 12 liter cans at a cost of one fourth of a cent. And this is door, de door delivered. Similarly, sanitation is a big issue. Only 50% of the houses have sanitation uh, facilities. 50% you know, of the houses have toilets. We said that 100% of them should have toilet facilities. And you wouldn't believe that it takes no more than few dollars to be able to provide these facilities. You know, it, is, it costs you no more than 70 to $80. And you subsidize to an extent of something like $20 or $25. So it is not a cost issue. So we have uh, been able to make enormous progress uh, there. Four percent of the people suffer from diabetes, and most of them don't have access to medical care. We have been able to provide this care at 25 cents a day. Four percent of the people suffer from hypertension. Again, it costs you no more than 25 cents. We have been able to address issues around eye care. Eight percent of the people suffer from problems relating to uh, the eye, and uh, it may be uh, a need for uh, glasses, and glasses cost no more than $2. In fact, there are many organizations globally who are willing to support. It is just that you have to have a mechanism uh, to deliver those services. Uh, and the list uh, uh, goes on. There are 30 different services identified, and we are operating with this 100% principle as a mechanism, and we believe that in most cases, by the end of this year, we would have achieved the 100% uh, uh, principle. I would like to, you know, given the limitation of time, uh, only talk about what we have learned, what personally I have learned as, as an individual in doing so. Generally, uh, you operate with a mindset that poverty is difficult to eliminate, and that it would take 30 or 40 years for a developing country to become a developed country. Our experience tells us that the issues at the grassroots can be addressed in a matter of few years. It doesn't take 40 or 50 years for a developing country to become a developed country. It would take no more than a maximum of 10 to 15 years. And if it is done in a focused way, as I was reporting here, in a matter of three or four years, we are able to provide services at levels that can be compared with what happens in a developed country. The second learning is that the satisfaction in you derive in providing these services is far greater than the satisfaction that you derive in deploying your resources for your own personal benefit. Therefore, we have always promoted this concept that when you are giving, it's an opportunity for you. It is not a favor that you are uh, uh, providing for someone. In fact, it is an opportunity that that person in need is providing to you to service him so that you can derive a great satisfaction of having wiped tears off their faces. The third thing that we have come to realize is that saving lives is a more serious business than making money. Therefore, it is not those who are retired, those who find a little time once in a while that would like to extend. It is to be done with a focus. Therefore, anyone who is volunteering and who is getting involved, you know, we have a ratio of about, about one is to five. For every full-time associate within the company, at least five times there should be volunteers. But those volunteers cannot come there as though they are doing favors. You know, they have to commit themselves and then only we are uh, making them a part of what we uh, do. Uh, I would uh, uh, like to uh, very quickly state that each of uh, these services are regarded as businesses. 
were benchmarking every activity against the best that you observe and, ha and, and see happen in uh, the best of companies. And we are saying that is the benchmark. It is just that you have to extend the same level of service even when it comes to servicing a need at a rural uh, village. And we are uh, addressing a couple of issues. One is about each business having the best assets that you can imagine. And we monitor them through a process called the 6P model. You would like to see the people dimension at a mature level, a process dimension at a mature level. It is the product, you know, which is about automating things at a mature level. Proliferation, which is about adopting the best practices. Patent, you know, which is about innovation. And finally, promotion, where you are able to effectively communicate what you are doing. So this is the asset dimension. The other dimension is what is referred to as the 5R dimension. Everything ends with an R, faster, better, cheaper, larger, and steadier. We are saying that on these dimensions, you, know, you have to measure the outcomes. And we believe that kind of focused attempt is bringing about a greater uh, delivery uh, mechanism. Satyam Foundation uh, has uh, adopted a principle of having at least 10% of the uh, people being encouraged to be volunteers within the, within the company. And we have an initiative called the Magnificent 7 Initiative. And Magnificent 7 Initiative is about having groups of seven people formed among these volunteer groups to work on um, being uh, able to uh, make a difference when it comes to specific projects. Having said this, you know, now I would like to uh, have my uh, colleague Venkat, Venkat uh, talk about uh, EMRI, uh, which is an initiative, as I have stated, uh, to address the emergency management issues uh, in India. Thank you so much uh, once again for uh, giving this opportunity to myself and our colleagues uh, to present to you uh, some of the work that we have done. Okay. Thank you, Rosa. Very good morning. And I'm, a, I'm happy to talk about uh, EMRI. Basically, we want to share with you how we can synergize various entities uh, like uh, social entrepreneurship, partnerships, innovation, leadership, and technology. How we can synergize each of these entities and use them for saving lives, particularly at the bottom of the pyramid. The whole project EMRI is meant for saving lives. We envisage to save at least 2 million lives a year by 2010, and we envisage to take at least uh, 2 million calls a day based on the US experience of receiving, uh, you know, for the 300 million population, they get around uh, 200 million calls a year. And our experience of last eight months tells us exactly the same. Based on that, we expect to receive 2 million calls a day. That infrastructure, those processes, the technology, and the people is what we are uh, visioning to uh, do. While doing so, last eight months, what we saved was 3,000 lives in these uh, towns where we operated. Extrapolating that to the country as a whole, we'll be able to save uh, 2 million lives a year and every year. We'd like to show you a small film for five minutes, uh, uh, briefly explaining uh, what EMRI is. Pranam Deva Anupranandi Manushah Pasu Vatsaye Prano Hi Bhuta Namayu Tasmat Sarvayusha Muchate When emergency strikes, the prana or life is in danger, and this calls for quick attention. Unfortunately, in India, the emergency rate is high, with over 80% deaths happening in the first hour itself, the golden hour. And this calls for a responsible emergency management system. As an individual who's contributed to the progress of the world and has taken India to enviable heights, 
Mr. Ramalinga Raju, founder and chairman Satyam Computers, has been one of the very few to look at the humanitarian side of life. And one such effort is EMRI's 108, an emergency management system set up through public-private partnership to reach out to the society in its hour of need. The 108 Emergency Service is here to respond to every kind of emergency, medical, fire and police. 108 is the first of its kind emergency service in India and has proved to be the life saviour of thousands in a very short span, thanks to the three cardinal pillars of EMRI's emergency management system. Sense, reach and care. Through constant research, EMRI's efforts have been to better emergency management by working towards enhancing the scope of sense, faster reach and immediate care. Taking off as a pilot project on the 15th of August 2005, 108 has been responsible for saving thousands of lives. Today, the team of associates of EMRI respond to thousands of calls from across Andhra Pradesh, reaching out to them wherever they are. In managing emergencies, technology can play a key role, and providing this support to the EMRI is Satyam Computer Services Limited. EMRI is backed by high-end technology comprising voice loggers, GIS, GPS and mobile communication. An emergency can be of any type. Broadly, they are categorized as medical, police and fire in nature. And 108 is equipped to respond to every need under them. 108 is backed by a fleet of life-saving ambulances and trained paramedics who provide life-saving treatment on the way to the hospital with support from trained pilots. EMRI's focus has been to take emergency care to the poorest sections of the society, which accounts for about 80% of our nation's population, and to give it the much-needed special status, 108 is a toll-free number accessible from both landlines and mobile phones. 108 has truly been a life saviour to many alive, both in the urban and rural areas, with many having a reason to thank it. EMRI is committed to realise its vision of responding to 2 million calls a day by the year 2010. EMRI knows there is so much more that needs to be done and surely there is so much more that can be done with active public participation. What is also required is the effective use of India's wide and strong communications network, its growing technology and implementing 108 all over the country to make India a safer place for the common man. Pranam Deva Anuprananti Manusha Pasuachaye Prano Hi Bhuta Namayu Tasmat I'd like to share with you what uh, happened in the last eight months and what we could achieve in terms of the metrics and then uh, uh, how it was possible in terms of creating differentiators at various levels. Uh, but we must tell you this project wouldn't have been possible so soon uh, but for the Google. We could, uh, you know, more than uh, first uh, six months, we spent time in uh, finding out uh, what are the best practices uh, 
in this field of emergency management and what kind of uh, best practices are there across the world, uh, what kind of ambulances have been there, and then we created the differentiators. Uh. So I'd like to share with you that uh, in these eight months, we were able to launch in 38 towns uh, in Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh, one of the 29 states with a population of 80 million out of the 1,000 million population in the country. Starting on 15th August uh, at uh, Hyderabad, we launched uh, till now 38 towns, uh, 108. Uh, this was launched by the Chief Minister on 15th August with the IT Minister and then uh, President of India launched in Bhimavaram on the Jan 9th and then 36 more towns were launched. Uh, basically what we achieved was uh, 40,000 emergency calls we handled in the last eight months and out of the 1.5 million emergency calls, uh, the balance calls basically talk about uh, enquiries and uh, what you do kind of things which we are uh, transferring it to the IVR in course of time. And at a cost of $1 a call is what we have been uh, spending today to handle one emergency call against uh, what it costs according to our study, $43 in US. Whereas uh, uh, we have been able to take almost 85% uh, of the calls in the very first two rings. And most importantly, 43% of the emergencies are medical. Against we estimate here it to be around 20%. Uh, we have been able to save 3,000 lives uh, uh, at a cost of $350 is what it costed to save a life. Uh, from the time call comes, taking the info, sending the ambulance, taking the patient to hospital, we were able to do that in 35 minutes uh, in these uh, medical emergencies of close to 18,000. We, the 3,000 lives, basically more than one-fourth or so close to that is from uh, head injuries of road traffic accidents, followed by traumas and then to the uh, pregnancies and pediatric. Uh, this number will keep going up as we cover more and more uh, uh, rural areas. Uh, we also thought we should award the people who have been doing this work outside EMRI, who have been doing this work, like uh, uh, some of the individuals who show selfless heroism in emergencies, what we called as she, those awards we gave it to 13 people who did this kind of work. Also, nurses who are the emergency nurses who saved lives of people. In addition to doctors' efforts, nurses put a lot of efforts. We thought we should recognize them and uh, rewarded 21 of them. Media was extensively uh, covering 108. Uh, I don't think a day passes without uh, uh, 108 being covered in uh, Andhra Pradesh or sometimes in the national channels, uh, in the regional language as well as the English uh, channels. Uh. Uh, basically, EMRI was formed uh, last year on April 2nd, 2005, the day on which we signed a public-private partnership with the government of Andhra Pradesh. This kind of uh, 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 vision cannot be achieved unless there is a partnership from uh, uh, government, unless there is a partnership with many people. So from that day, April 2nd, after signing the agreement, uh, uh, we said that it has to be a not-profit institute, it cannot make profits. So. And this red uh, dot on the top is the customer uh, who is suffering from emergencies. He's the emergency victim who may not really bleed all the time. Other than the road traffic accidents like cardiac or uh, uh, paralysis or uh, uh, epileptic fits and that kind of things uh, or uh, poisoning, suicides, uh, it need not bleed, but uh, it is an emergency which has to be attended within the one hours to save his life. And so that uh, the the... One part of 911 is handling emergencies. There's another one called EMS in uh, US where they send the ambulances. We combined both of them under one roof, saying that uh, taking the number, taking the uh, emergency victim's information and sending the help, if it is under one umbrella, the processes can be better. And that's what we call as EM part of emergency management till such time the help reaches the victim. And the R part of EMRI is the research part, why these emergencies are happening, and can we prevent them, can we handle them better. And the I part is basically training, uh, institute part where we want to train and create value at various levels who handle the patients. Uh, instead of patient going to the doctor, the hospital, can we add value before re reaching the hospital with a first responder who attends to him at the house or on the road, or the emergency technician who handles in the ambulance, and then the doctors who attend to him uh, in the ICU or in the emergency room. At these three levels, we are designing training programs to add value to the emergency victim. 
Uh, actually, we have ventured to define emergency because 911 has been here last 25 years. There's no need to define emergency there. We were to say it has to come suddenly. It has to threaten the life. But your property also can be danger. You can also uh, think of an order of the life getting disturbed. Uh, any of the conditions involving medical or a police or a fire together uh, occurring at individual level, not at, uh, uh, you know, where thousands and millions of people getting involved in the tsunamis and floods, that disasters are separate from these emergencies which happen at individual level, which were by and large not so much attended to till now. And these are emergencies unfortunately occur at the bottom of the pyramid since the population is that 80 percent. That is what we need to address and uh, attend to those emergencies and bring them back from emergency. The context is, as we have seen, 80 percent of the deaths happen in the first one hour of admission. That is because somebody delaying and uh, the admission process and uh, taking uh, inability to dial, inability to get help, inability to get transport, uh, inability to get a pre-hospital care led to the deaths in the hospital in the first one hour itself. On the top of it, uh, 136,000 mothers dying every year during pregnancies. Particularly, it doesn't happen during the pregnancy. It happens after the delivery when the bleeding is unable to be controlled. Uh, road traffic accidents, uh, though the number looks to be smaller, but uh, this is what is reported. Uh, but unfortunately, 450,000 people lose one of their limbs every year. And then 200,000, which happen every day emergencies, are underreported, not reported, not recognized as emergencies. This is the context of setting EMRI to save lives from these emergencies and give them that convenience. What they need convenience is a single number. What they need is uh, a transport facility. What they need is pre-hospital care. So we thought to do this, we must differentiate what we are providing at uh, various levels. We said uh, what, in which way people get differentiated, in which way process, the technology, ambulances. On the top of it, campus has to be something distinctly different. With whom we collaborate has to be different. And why we are doing research which is distinctly different from any other uh, uh, 911 and other institutions. On the top of it, how do we train and add people? These eight, I would like to elaborate. The first one, people, what we thought is, we don't want qualified BTECs and MTECs and the engineers and that kind of thing for doing this job. What we need is someone who listens, someone who is positive for us. From the time he gets into the ambulance, this guy, instead of saying, you will die, you will die, he has to say, you will live. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, a, it's really difficult to build that attitude on the top of it. What we expected him to be a little more elegant in terms of his drive and uh, compassion. On the top of it, he cannot afford to be subjective and getting uh, treatment. Uh, he has to be objective. He has to be passionate about changing lives. More importantly, we know how to talk, but this guy has to listen what the patient is talking without interpreting. On the top of it, treating the patient with, uh, with uh, love and compassion. These qualities are extremely difficult to find. Out of, if I interview, 1,000 people, I get only 48. 4.8% uh, is the success rate. These, uh, we have seven step uh, uh, interview process, recruitment process. So 1,000 in the first process finally comes to only 48 at the end. To get to this uh, 600 people, we were to recruit almost, uh, you know, uh, 20 times of that. And we call, again, to give this kind of uh, people status in the society, instead of calling them drivers, we call them as pilots. So. Same way, instead of calling somebody as a call taker, what is called here, in India, it is taker is not taken as a, uh, is not taken properly, so we thought we should call him as communication officers. So these are, uh, though they are not that high paid uh, uh, software professional jobs, but they add a lot of value in changing lives, so we title them accordingly. On the top of it, the process, what we thought is 108, uh, many people ask me why we have chosen this number, why not 911? So we thought, why to copy after 25 years of experience? In India particularly, uh, when we did a research, we found that uh, in an emergency, you don't go to the bottom of the instrument. Uh, you only go to the top of the instrument. So we thought a number starting with one is better. And then one zero takes priority over any other number. And then one zero eight, we thought uh, this is universally reserved across the country for emergencies. Uh, and particularly, we made sure that when we did a research, when we got this number, we asked people, they said, is it free? I don't mind dying, but I won't spend one rupee for dialing this. <laughs> so we were to make it free first. Huh? Then we did one more research. Huh? They said, uh, is it possible to dial on both of them, landline and mobile? Then only I'll use it. Huh? 
So this mobile phenomena had caught up so much that even in emergency, he wants to use his mobile and get the satisfaction. We said, okay, we will give you that also. It can happen on both of them. And then we said, uh, you know, it's, uh, then they said, why is this, uh, what is the significance of this number? So, so many theories we have been telling people after getting this number, you know, if you want to treat this number as spiritual, you treat it. 1 plus 8 comes 9, you think like that. And 108, many religions treat it as a spiritual number. Whatever you want to do, but please dial in case of emergency. And then we thought, uh, the, the process we defined is it has to land on the PSTN and to the nodal switch. And then it takes inputs from various servers. And from the server, the CO takes the input, what telephone database it has. All the landlines, it takes the input from there. The address pops up on the system. And then transfers this data, what he got from the uh, emergency victim to the dispatch officer. Then he takes inputs again from the emergency database, which hospital, what kind of things. And then the GIS database, he picks up and identifies which ambulance is the nearest and closest which he can assign. This is the entire process. In the process, there is a doctor sitting in the call center who conferences with the patient and tells him whether he needs medical help even before ambulance comes. If he's hypoglycemic, he tells him, you need a glass, you need a, a spoon of sugar you take before ambulance comes. That kind of advice for a common man who could not even afford five rupees to go in a cycle rickshaw, he is able to afford to ring up free, get into the ambulance free, and get also medical advice free. So the various applications in terms of what a communication officer requires or a dispatch officer requires, what vehicle management systems or uh, pre-hospital care systems and vehicle where on the top of it, we, we know precisely in these 40,000 emergencies what the geographic, demographic, uh, medical information, uh, uh, what applications are required to handle these. And the GIS maps of all these towns are there uh, with 40 landmarks per square kilometer kind of thing helped us really to assign the vehicle and the guy is able to go pilot and the EMT faster. On the top of it, uh, the deployment of ambulance also we are able to do with this. Uh, more importantly, now we are able to even predict what kind of uh, uh, emergencies will come in this area. The fourth differentiator is ambulances. So having people and the process and technology, we thought we should take him finally. Having uh, the most uh, uh, latest process and technology of no use, but the guy should uh, be transported in the latest ambulance. That's where uh, we used extensively Google more than anybody else. We must have jammed the whole system. If you had seen in April 2005 to June 2005, I saw 400 photographs of ambulances across the world. Then we thought, let us not believe all of them. Let us go physically and saw them again in the US, in Singapore, all that. And finally, we designed something unique. Where we thought uh, we should have an Indian vehicle, we bought the Tempo Traveler only for $12,000 and we spent another $30,000. We thought patient comfort is uh, important, but more important is relative's comfort. Patient's relative's comfort is important, so let him have air conditioned ambulance. And patient relative safety is important, so we thought he should have the belts and that kind of thing. And more importantly, we thought the public safety is important outside. What is that we are giving outside and how the pilot drives now? Then we thought patient comfort, not one stretcher, you must have five stretchers. Not the normal stretcher for scoop stretcher is for spinal injuries, wheelchair for somebody who cannot walk, children's stretcher is different, foldable stretcher is different. And there are many other things like uh, splints are there to immediately cast the fra when there is a fracture to immobilize the uh, fractured portion. Or we have particularly to meet Indian medical conditions, we have a small rope which costs less than a dollar to save a guy when he drowns in a well. Or we have uh, extrication tools inside this box uh, where the relatives sit uh, to remove the patients from the accidents uh, when the collision takes place. So that's why last week somebody was telling me, don't use this word accident. Uh, they said, accident, what is this in your country? It is accident is something which happens suddenly, unexpectedly. But all your accidents, you know you are going on a wrong way. You know there is no helmet. You know you don't have a seat belt. And you are going anyway opposite side. Whenever there is a put there, don't enter, you enter there. So these accidents are all known. But still, though they are known, we thought we should do something for him where we have this kind of extrication tools. Last but not least, two. We have two equipments, the most costliest one, which costs more than, uh, uh, you know, 25% of this ambulance cost is a ventilator and an uh, automatic external defibrillator. 
these are the two take over the heart and lungs function when they fail now. The next uh, differentiator is this campus, which we build, built in seven months time. But of course, my chairman says you are delayed by one month. Seven months, we were able to build this 40,000 square feet in a 40 acre campus. This is what was, uh, uh, you know, something this call center, this response center is. You go to Brooklyn, you go, yesterday we went to Marin uh, County in San Francisco. This is something 100 times better than that in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of what you see. Because these guys have to see the greenery, they have to breathe. So. Next is collaboration differentiators. Other than government, we also wanted to collaborate with various hospitals. 594 hospitals have signed to agree to accept the patient for the first 24 hours to stabilize. Then the NGOs, the volunteers, various corporations, US agencies of this 911 association called NINA, and physicians of Indian origin here, emergency doctors, victims themselves partnering, and then such computers developing technology for us. Seventh differentiate is research, as I showed, why these area 16 we selected, why are they happening, can we prevent them, can we also treat them better? The last but not least is adding training for better patient care in terms of what do we do before the hospital and at the hospital. So these are the first responders and the EMT technicians and uh, the doctors in the call center. Whereas the doctors in the clinic and ICU room and uh, emergency room doctors, we identified syllabus and the programs to conduct for them. So having done these eight differentiators, explain our future plan from 38 towns. We are going to 50 towns in Andhra Pradesh to cover 20 billion population by end of this month. And the balance 60 million population of Andhra Pradesh predominantly villages of numbering around 20,000. We thought we should be able to cover them with volunteered resources as per the protocols, processes, technology of 108, but volunteered time, volunteered uh, money, or volunteered vehicle, so that we connect those to EMRI and provide exactly the same service to these villages in the, by end of September. Nationally, we want to achieve our vision of 2 million calls and 2 million lives by 2010 by involving uh, many franchises. Uh, they could be NGOs or volunteers or corporations who want to take up this and go to Maharashtra, go to next state and next state. The rest of the states, they can go and run this as per this technology and these standards and uh, these kind of protocols with uh, the state and central and the uh, uh, county government officials cooperating. So what does it uh, offer to uh, to us uh, between uh, Google and us, what kind of partnership opportunities are there? One is, can we have a kind of knowledge management initiative for emergencies? So, is there a scope for uh, virtual labs for schools to educate people? There is a possibility of these maps being uh, utilized at higher level, where it could be used not only for emergency management, also for improving agriculture. Can we also think of a virtual leadership with your volunteerism, like what uh, Chairman has told about Magnificent Seven Teams, so participating in your volunteer time on a specific projects like 100 projects, what we're working, some of those projects where you can give your time and uh, uh, your ideas. So, so to put it all together, uh, India will be one of the five countries by 2020 is our vision to make it happen. The GDPs and agriculture and uh, manufacturing, all that is going on one side, the services. To make it happen, we should respect uh, value and care life. To do that, we should develop a little more of humanness, a little more of humbleness. And lastly, every one of us should get committed to serve the society than leaving it only to the bureaucrats and politicians. Thank you so much. Yeah, the question is, how does this 35 minutes response time compare to the other countries? I mean, US particular 911. We don't have the published data, but what we heard is it is less than one hour. Now, it's close to 40 minutes, 50 minutes, one hour. Uh, it may be sometimes 30, 40 minutes also. 
but this kind of metrics uh, and published data is not available. Yeah. yeah. Basically, 911 is only for handling the call and dispatching a vehicle. That we are doing three minutes. And whereas the 35 minutes include the vehicle going to home and from home to hospital, that 32 minutes. Whereas here, it is handled by EMS separately, where uh, their times vary because there are multiple organizations, uh, voluntary, profit, non-profit kind of institutes. Yeah. Nationally, how do we go with the single system? Yeah. Yeah. No, in, actually, if you, the question is that uh, how do we expand from Andhra Pradesh to other states? Do we need to modify? Do we need to adopt anything? Uh, uh, frankly, there is uh, not much of adaptation in terms of the processes and the technology. It's only the people locally, you have to employ them who could identify the place and take. And uh, the emergencies are exactly the same. Same kinds of emergencies happen. It's, uh, it's only the local governments have to support them as much as this government is supporting us in Andhra Pradesh. That's the only variation. Maybe in each state, we will have an entrepreneur or a franchisee who will run this with the same passion as we are doing in Andhra Pradesh. That will be a big challenge for us to get those and institute this kind of discipline and also train them to handle this kind of thing. So we envisage a role for us nationally that uh, you know, we EMRI will lay these standards and processes. We are also talking to the government to form an authority which will lay down certain standards, uh, who should run an ambulance, who will accept this kind of uh, running the center, and who will fund it. That kind of uh, negotiation we are doing and preparing a document so that it goes across the same standards. So you will employ local for different yes. We will employ local people who could, uh, that's where the ability to identify the place and speak the language is important. What is the political landscape for making this happen at the national level? Various states are not as progressive as maybe Andhra Pradesh. And there might be a lot of political, you know, they want their people to run it and they want their own technology and so on. What is the landscape look like? Yeah, at least our, our your question, what you are saying is, what is the, how the politics will come into the picture of making it happen nationally. Our experience of last eight months, the Andhra Pradesh government is progressive and they have been supportive. But more importantly, this kind of passion as a not-for-profit institute to, change, to save the lives, I don't think uh, any politician, any politics can really stop. Uh, from our dialogues with various uh, politicians of various parties, everybody loves to handle this. Off late, actually, as I was saying, last uh, 10 to 15 launches, the politician respective uh, towns who were there, even before even we invited them, they said, I would like to be party to it, and I'll come to the dais and uh, you know, launch this. So, because they also get a credit. And uh, some of these guys even announced that uh, I actually convinced EMRI to come to this town. They didn't have any plans, actually, I convinced. But we are happy with it, because we don't want to take panga with it. As long as we serve the people, <laughs> And he takes the credit, uh, you be prepared to give it. Huh? Thank, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry, yeah. How do Google Maps make you responsible for We used a lot of uh, things outside Google Maps of Google search engines, but Google Maps we haven't used because we require the kind of landmarks. So. Uh, what we require uh, 40 per square kilometer, what you have done is a little bit at higher level. That level of maps which are required in our towns, what we are talking, population of 90,000 and 80,000 population, and the, the, the landmarks, hospitals, the reference points were not done. But uh, maybe, as I was saying, that is the partnership opportunity available between Google and uh, uh, Satyam. A hell of a lot of uh, scope is there for us to do that. But we have spent money for these towns already uh, to go to that kind of level. But I wish we are able to do something together. Yeah. Uh, are you 
frequently discussing these calls to police and all. For example, if the emergency is not medical emergency, somebody is being threatened or something. Yeah, that's a good question actually because we, this is a comprehensive number first of all, 108 meant for medical, police and fire and our emergency handling, 57% of the emergencies are police emergencies, 43% are police, um, uh, medical. So, so far we handled 23,000 uh, police emergencies where the police dispatch officer sits in our centre and uh, he takes the communication officer, the moment it is a uh, police emergency, he transfers to that guy. It could be crime, it could be sexual assault, rape, and sometimes ragging. I'm surprised. Ragging also people ring up and say, I'm, my life is uh, being threatened and we send the police there. Yeah, thank you. Where does the, there are various places in which you just find medical emergencies to triage the emergencies, so decide exactly what level of care, where to bring people back to a hospital. How do you train your people? Yeah, thank you. You want to know what kind of triaging we are doing to ensure that he goes to a, a, a right uh, a doctor for the care. Uh, basically, transport time, we want to minimize where we are putting an ambulance for... Uh, uh, you know, 100,000 population is one ambulance kind of thing is what we are planning. So country as a whole, we require 10,000 ambulances to see that uh, the distance traveled is only both the ways is less than one hour. So that the golden hour could be maintained. Uh, secondly, the emergency technicians is a profession which doesn't exist in the country. This is the first time any concept called pre-hospital care is first time what we did was we took the trained nurses, we took them physiotherapists, we took the other uh, people first, but we couldn't uh, get the numbers. Uh, so we took life science graduates, fresh ones, and trained them for three months. And first month in the classroom, one month in the ambulance, one month in the hospitals. Then every two months, we call them back for refresher courses, so they're able to see the patient. Uh, particularly what they need to do is, uh, the 16 emergencies we identified, uh, right from cardiac to poisoning to this, what they need to do in terms of airways, in terms of breathing, in terms of circulation, what they need to do, minimum protocols we have given and kept in the ambulance for him to do. Whereas uh, normally triage is done in the in US in the emergency departments. Unfortunately, those numbers don't exist. So we are also working in the direction of upgrading those emergency rooms and casualty rooms so that emergency medicine as a profession has to be brought to the country. It doesn't exist today, unfortunately. Thank you.